Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday Evening Bible Study. This is the Bible study for February 3rd, 2021. This is being recorded on Saturday, January 30th, 2021. And we are in Acts chapter 18 tonight. Let's start in verse 1. Uh, by the way, just to, to tell you where we are, Paul is on a second missionary journey. He's been going from town to town. He's learned how to um, do missions work uh, in just by practical experience and leading the Holy Spirit. And he's gone from city to city. And um, he had been in Athens, and he... Uh, now has left. So, starting in verse 1 of chapter 18. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had, Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now, now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus, Titius, Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Acacia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If you Jews are making a complaint, about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names in your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern whatever. Interesting little passage here. Um, you know, Paul, after he starts a church in Athens, goes on to the next city. He actually, uh, first time we have recorded that he doesn't get in trouble to have to leave a city. He was there by himself. He worked for a while. Uh, he developed a small church. He taught them and he left. Uh, Timothy and... Uh, Silas still never caught up with him. They were supposed to catch up with him in Athens, but they had been left behind to finish the work where he had been. They finished the work, and they finally catch up with him in Corinth. And uh, But before he gets there, before they get there to be with him, to help him, support him, um, he meets some fellow Jews, um, and they had been living in Rome, and um, the Roman emperors had this habit that every once in a while they would kick a certain people group out of Rome when uh, uh, it became politically expedient to. And Jews were one of those people that got picked on quite a bit. Um, and normally, um, after a time, they would just kind of quietly uh, let anybody back in and, as long as you weren't causing trouble. And um, so the Jews would get to come back and live in Rome again. And then 
some other emperor would kick him out. Well, so Aquila and Priscilla uh, worked making tents. Uh, apparently, the same profession Paul had. It's the first time and only uh, that we have that they made that Paul made tents. But it's well known that most rabbis had a profession, and one of the things that they were to do as uh, rabbis, yes, they were to teach God's word, but they were also to teach their profession. They were to teach the young how to read and write, and how to do arithmetic, basic. Um, I'm going to say business math, be able to account and uh, things like that, be able to know where they were making money. And they also had a job skill, and most of them actually earned most of their money by doing that profession. Um, uh, fairly uh, famous rabbis were bricklayers, and um, we know Paul was a tent maker. Um, some were weavers, some were uh, goldsmiths, and all kinds of professions. Milkmen, and you name it. Um, uh, basically, if anybody in Jewish society did that profession uh, in the first century, uh, some rabbi did, and taught it to people. And very often, um, after you got to a certain age, if you wanted to learn a, a certain profession, uh, say you decide you want to be a carpenter, uh, you would look around and your family would look around and they would find a rabbi that taught carpentry. And you would be sent off to that town to essentially apprentice under him uh, and to work with him, learn his trade. And uh, so they taught the very young to read and write and do arithmetic. They taught the whole community, scripture, and how to interpret it. Uh, they organized the meetings. They did a lot of things that were needed in the community to keep pe the community organized and people organized. But they also had a profession that they did that actually supported them and their family and their ministry. And, and then they did that, too. And they couldn't do it full-time like they were uh, only did that profession because they also had to teach and uh, some of the other things too. And so very often, you know, you the rabbi was paid to also teach. Uh, and then during part of the day, he would be teaching whatever profession he did. And he would gather the students that were with him for that. And they would do what it is that he knew how to do, and he'd show them and teach them, and they would be his workers. Uh, very often, the family would be paying him to teach them the profession, and um, the faster you learned it, the faster you got to go out and be a whatever. Uh, if you were going to study under Paul and learn to make tents, then the faster you learned to make tents, the faster you got to quit studying under Paul and go out and make tents on your own and run your own business. Uh, but while you worked for him, you made tents for him, and he sold the tents <coughs> you made. And so that is part of the rabbinic system. And so, you know, Grace Fellowship Baptist Church with its bivocational ministers are actually very biblical. That is the... Christian church was originally built on the synagogue model where the pastor had another job and um, they did that job to earn a living and support themselves and their um, family and then did the ministry on the side. So most Christian ministers up through say, the 3rd century A.D., or actually what we call bivocational today. Um, of course, most churches were small, and a lot of churches were family churches. Uh, they met in the household of the believer, and maybe some of their friends and relatives and neighbors might come over, but, you know, um, 
the patriarch of the family was the pastor, so to speak. Or he might appoint a male relative to be the one who did it. And he worked in whatever the family business was. But he also had the responsibility of the spiritual things of the household. And so, you know, he might do less, um, you know, whatever the household did uh, as a group than other people because he had other responsibilities that were necessary for the household, too. Because worship and worshiping God correctly was also viewed as part of what the family needed to do. And um, that was a model that wasn't just in Christianity. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans very often practiced that. They would have some member of their household that was a priest uh, for whatever gods they worshipped. And uh, our priests, several even priests, in some of the larger households. And some of the Roman senators were known to have, you know, a dozen different priests to a dozen different gods in their household. Uh, make sure that, you know, they had everybody covered, so to speak. And so the Christians, having a Christian minister in their household to uh, lead worship and plan it and coordinate it, be the uh, evangelical uh, member of the family to reach out to other people in the community, that was just part and parcel of first century life. Um, you know, if you were a big enough household, you could have your whole household meet in your house and worship, and y'all happened to worship, say, Zeus. You had a priest of Zeus in your house. He was expected to you know, perform the rituals of Zeus for anybody in the community that needed to go worship Zeus. So if you were Christian and you were expected to do the ministry the Christian minister would need to do and uh, reach out in the community, um, whatever. And uh, so that, that was a kind of a native model that Paul's doing here. He's earning his living, and he's making tents, and obviously you don't just make them and set them up and walk off and leave them. You sell them, and um, so you've got to be in the marketplace and people shopping and people making orders, and he has a natural road in then to people uh, talking to people because people are going to be seeking him out for what he makes, um, shopping for him. Um, tent makers also very often did repairs on tents, things like that. So, you know, the, it's something the community needs. He was supplying an economic need the community needed and his own economic needs, therefore. So later when in the letters he tells people, you know, don't be lazy and work and support yourself, he's not speaking as an overlord of the community, he's saying, do what I do. Uh, I'm, I'm this example. I have earned my own living. Um, you go earn your own living. Uh, he's, not, he's not being casual there. He's not setting up a, a deal that he himself doesn't do. He's following that model. Now, when Silas and Timothy get there and they can uh, support him um, so he can spend full time evangelizing, then he does let them support him. Uh, there's nothing in Paul's model that says you have to be bivocational. If you can get people to support you so you can do the work full time, great, go for it. Um, he would also be very harsh on any uh, Christian practitioner uh, minister who did not, who was supported by his church, who didn't work full time, what he would consider full time. You got to understand they worked from at, uh, from sun up to sundown. Um, there was no such thing as an eight hour day there. Uh, if the sun shone from 6 in the morning to 6 at night, you work 12 hours. If it shone from 5.30 in the morning to uh, 
nine at night, you work that many hours. Um, so, you know, they were, he was working whatever hours he could work. Now, when Paul and Silas, I mean, uh, Silas and Timothy got there and they could support him. And that was part of what your traveling companions were for you in a case like this, is somebody had to provide the economic support of the group while you made your way about. Well, he was able to spend a year and a half there uh, preaching the gospel full time. And I mean, by that, and he probably spent an average of 12 hours a day evangelizing, six days a week. He, did, he took, I'm sure he took a day off to rest. He understood biblical principles. Um, but, you know, can you imagine 72 hours a week of evangelism? What that would do? Um, and he had the freedom to do it there in Corinth. Uh, the Corinthians didn't uh, get upset with him. When they finally did, some of the Jews decided, okay, we got we got to do something about Paul. He's converting too many people, and we've kicked him out of the synagogue, and he's still doing it, and he's doing it with the Gentiles, and he's being effective, and he's making bigger inroads here, so we got to, and they basically take him to court suing, but they go before a Roman proconsul. Now, Romans had the idea that it was not their business to try to regulate what gods did. They regulated what humans did. And so there was the, this concept that we would call religious freedom. The Roman government wasn't going to get involved in religion unless the religion was getting involved in whether they could govern or not. Now, if you started preaching that the Romans were an illegitimate government and the gods had decreed that, you know, your people group should be in charge, um, the Romans tended to you know, stick pointy sticks in you and um, till you quit preaching, you know, uh, you and your followers. On the other hand, uh, you know, as long as you prayed for the government, uh, they were like, sure, we can send all the prayer we can get. And um, two religious groups are arguing in the community, uh, let the gods figure it out. Uh, you know, may the God, a stronger God win, you know, and you know, both of you pray for us until God sorts it out. Uh, it's kind of their approach to it. And so this pro council, when he hears they're arguing about religion, he's going to dismiss this suit. It, it means nothing to him. He does not want to accidentally enrage the up-and-coming God. Uh, okay, you're, he's gaining more adherence. Well, man, maybe his God's better than yours. It's kind of his attitude. Uh, I don't worship that God either, but, you know, you don't see me going out and telling the guy to be quiet. You know, if his God's winning right now, well, you know, I'll get around to thinking about his religion later. Uh, it's kind of the Roman attitude toward it at this point in time. Uh, they still haven't understood the world-changing nature of Christianity. Uh, basically, the Jews are the only ones complaining about it, and, you know, the Romans had put up with the Jews claiming they were exclusive and had the only God for two centuries now. Um, and they're, you know, hey, we put up with y'all claiming exclusivity and we've still been worshiping and, uh, you know, we haven't noticed a whole lot of difference just because you claim that our gods aren't real. real. So, you know, okay, you got another competitor that's claiming they have an only God? Oh, well. <laughs> let me make the real God win in between the two of y'all. And when y'all get it settled, and, you know, we'll consider it. Kind of their attitude. And um, so he pitches him out of court. You know, Paul's fixing it. Try to convince Gallio that, that um, he needs to be a Christian too. He thinks he has this opportunity to witness uh, and, you know, make his defense. And, um, Galileo didn't want to have anything to do with the religious arguments. Uh, he's kind of his attitude was, I've got mine, you've got yours, he's got his. Let's just get along. 
And so he pitches him out. And um, this Sosthenes was apparently the leader of the group. And when they lost and couldn't do anything to Paul, they beat him in front of Gallio. And Gallio just kind of like, yeah, that's a religious issue. It's not mine. You beat your leader up because he led you to do a stupid, foolish thing and spent a lot of money filing a lawsuit. And I made the money and dismissed the suit. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and um, now the the violence he could have dealt with as violence, but uh, he was just kind of let it, nature take its course, so to speak, uh, and uh, te teach the rest of the community. You don't want to mess with trying to bring Paul in court. And the reason Luke is bringing this part out is he's trying to put a precedent in the legal system that, hey, these other pro councils that have heard of Paul and had him in his court have found that it's a religious matter. It's not a political matter. It doesn't matter. And, you know, so Luke is pointing out other courts have already determined that Christianity is not a matter of political importance. So when it gets to the Supreme Court of that land, they don't have to, you know, Paul, uh, Luke is trying to point out, they don't have to determine fact. They're just trying to determine policy. And uh, the fact has been determined already by other courts that Christianity's perfectly fine religion in the community. And that's what this trial basically shows that uh, Luke is writing this account for, is that, yeah, Christianity is just another religion. They're not uh, anti-government. They're not trying to take over. They use some of the same words we use for our supreme leader, for their supreme leader, but he's in heaven and not here on earth, so they mean something a little different. Yeah, leave him alone. They're not trying to overthrow the emperor. We're, we're fine. And so the conclusion of this trial is that Christianity is allowed to flourish for a while until it finally comes to the point where enough of the Roman Empire is converted to Christianity that the Romans are beginning to go, wait a minute, uh, if they get organized, uh, we're in trouble. And then that's, but that's two generations later. Verse 6, uh, 18, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sinsharia uh, because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they, they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined, but as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he sailed for Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. So Luke is recording the trip uh, as he comes back to Antioch to finish the missionary journey. Notice uh, Silas and Timothy got left in Corinth. They've essentially become the pastors in Corinth um, or are doing missionary side trips out of Corinth or something. Uh, they're lost the record for a little while. Uh, it's Priscilla and Aquila that's traveling with him now. So Paul is not, um, well, he has an organization with him and he stays organized. He's not fixed on he has to keep the same people. If he gets to a situation and he needs to divide the party and part of the party do one thing and part of the party do another, he's already learned. Uh, split up. But that also means you need to constantly recruit people to help you, to work with you, and to uh, help support you. And so he had recruited Priscilla and Aquila. And he traveled with them for a while. 
and uh, he met, he went back through some of these towns he'd been in, and um, he even went back to the synagogues that kicked him out and reasoned with them, and they were happy to hear him again. Um, you know, quite interesting. He um, He's learning how to do Christian ministry without uh, creating as much of a flash uh, in the community. Um, he's already made the splash, so to speak, and there's a Christian community, and he encourages them and teaches them and uh, works with them, but he's still on that missional journey of evangelism, and so he's still trying to go wherever he can, convert whoever he can, uh, Jew first and Gentile next, and um, he, he Luke hasn't told yet, but he's on the way um, eventually uh, on the way to fulfill this vow. And um, so he's trying to get there by the time he wants to be. So he's not going to spend a lot of time in any one place. He's going to be in and out and keep moving. 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia. Phrygia, excuse me, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor, and he taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Paul's traveling on, and Paul is actually not the protagonist for this uh, last end of this chapter. Aquila and Priscilla are the protagonists here. They hear Apollos. Now, Apollos was preaching that Jesus was to come. He had heard and he knew Scripture, uh, and he was anticipating the Messiah. He had heard the teachings of John the Baptist. He was preaching the gospel according to John the Baptist. He had never heard of Jesus in the resurrection. And he's very uh, good orator, apparently. Um, apparently much better than Paul. Uh, some other places Paul makes references to that. Uh, and he's good at public debate. He's good at uh, creating attention. And the Jews don't mind him coming in the synagogue and preaching that the Messiah is coming and get prepared and to repent and believe and being a very moralistic people. Um, they're fine with that. And he's preaching baptism. Okay, that's the way to show your repenting. Um, they're fine with this. It doesn't upset their little apple cart that, you know, there's a once-for-all sacrifice and the Messiah is already here. Um, and he performed miracles that nobody else could do. Um, now, he was a native of Egypt. He was a Jew from Egypt. Uh, Alexander is in Egypt, and um, it was also a big Jewish center there. Um, they actually at one time had a replica of the temple there that uh, competed with the temple that was in Jerusalem. 
um, for trade uh, in religious matters. Uh, it was actually built before the one in uh, Jerusalem, as the one in, in Samaria was built before. The one in Samaria um, had been built by Samaritans. The one in Alexandria was built by the Jews that uh, had gone not into captivity, but had left pa uh, Palestine when the Babylonians captured it. And they, uh, you can read about them at the end of uh, the book of Jeremiah as they take Jeremiah down to Egypt. And um, they went down there and uh, established a Jewish community there. And uh, it prospered, and it eventually built its own temple because they recognized, uh, as did the Babylonian Jews, that Judaism required a place of worship. And um, they despaired of going back to Palestine. And... Um, so their solution was uh, build a temple where we are. And they had prospered enough they could afford it. And they made sure that they followed the directions that Moses had given, that um, uh, Daniel had given, that, um, you know, uh, the other prophets had given. Uh, they made sure that they built it. Uh, the only thing, the problem they had is they didn't build it in Jerusalem, where God had said his temple was going to be. And so the Babylonian Jews, they recognized they needed to build a temple in Jerusalem. So when they got a chance to go back to Jerusalem, they built the temple there. And even as late as... Uh, Well, um, as, as late as 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem uh, in the Jewish rebellion, at the end of the Jewish rebellion, um, they the three temples were competing with each other for adherence and who was right and who was best. And um, um, the Samaritans were rejected because they were half-breeds. They weren't fully Jew. They weren't really Jewish, so to speak. Um, some had their history that they never were Jewish to begin with, and they just believed Judaism. And so, you know, when you're not right, you're just not right, and it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, that's some of the animosity that uh, the Samaritans had. Um, the one down in Alexandria, uh, the main body of Judaism said, you're heretics because you built a temple where God said not to build a temple. Uh, if God didn't say build it there, you shouldn't have built it there. Uh, they said, on the other hand, we built a temple while you were standing around in Babylon, uh, not practicing Judaism by going to these little things called synagogues, and you were trying to practice Judaism without a temple. And, uh, you know, a kind of mutual rejection of each other because each of them made mistakes. Um and so, um, you know, that was the state of things. Now, um, each of the temples was then destroyed in turn. Um, the one in Jerusalem was actually the last destroyed. Uh, uh, the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple um, during the uh, Maccabean uh, Rebellion. And... Um, they cons the Maccabeans considered it a heresy and uh, destroyed it. Uh, that's part of the bad blood that you see in the New Testament between the Samaritans and the Jews. Um, uh, let's place it. It was definitely uh, some of the older people around. It was still in their living memory, um, the destruction of their temple of the Jews. Um and they'd taught their children and grandchildren. And those were the people in charge then. Um, you know, um, consider the bad blood we still have in the United States over the Civil War. Um, basically, the destruction of the uh, 
Samaritan temple. It was half that long ago. Um, we didn't have anything traumatic in the United States that long, but we still have bad blood over the Civil War. Uh, you know, the Samaritans, the Jews, yeah, uh, they got a longer memory than that. And it's still fresh. Uh, there were still people that would have seen the Samaritan Temple as children alive. Um, to keep it fresh that, hey, they did it to us. Um, and the Jews would still would have known people that had participated in it and the cleansing of the land and how that had that abomination. Um, you know, so... And uh, the Romans, when they conquered Alexandria, they basically destroyed every uh, temple there. Um, they didn't discriminate against the Jews, or particularly. Uh, they destroyed the Roman temples. The I mean, not the Roman, the Egyptian temples. And, oh, they just found one more. It happened to be Jewish. Okay, not a big deal. You know, when you're going in to conquer a city, you just conquer. Um, and part of their policy was you go in and conquer and then after the people are yours then you can ha let them have their religion um, conquering foreign people they they part of their strategy was they proved they were stronger than these gods and their gods were stronger than your gods uh, that's why you had to be part of the Roman Empire well so that is the city that um, Paulus is from. Uh, a big Jewish center, even in um, you know late first century uh, AD. Uh, big community there. Um, it was a center of learning. Um, it became a, a center of Christian learning too uh, later, but that was building on the foundation the Jews had already built there. And it had a big, uh, a whole host of well-recognized uh, rabbinic uh, schools that taught rabbis. Um, they had their own school of thought uh, that competed with the Pharisaical school, um, the Alexandria school. Uh, kind of interesting. Uh, the name was named after a Greek god in Egypt um, and became the name of both a Jewish movement and a Christian movement um, later. So Apollos uh, was a well-educated man. He probably had, uh, from what's mentioned here about him, not only the Pentateuch memorized, but also all the prophets that were recognized as being biblical prophets. Um, he had a, most of the commentary that was known, memorized, and he could therefore argue very effectively. He was uh, well trained in uh, public debate. He was well trained in scripture and in scriptural reasoning. And... Um, Therefore, when he learned about Jesus accurately, that he was the Messiah, had been raised from the dead, he basically learned what we have in the New Testament. Um, of course, at that time, it hadn't yet been written down by uh, Mark or uh, Matthew or Luke, and definitely not by John. John's uh, gospel still way in the future uh, from their perspective. And... Um, so he learns that Jesus had come and that he was the Messiah and he'd been crucified and died and raised from the dead and then ascended to heaven. Uh, you know, it doesn't take much for him to believe because he knows the scripture about the Messiah and he sees that, hey, yes, Jesus fulfilled the Messiah the scriptures for the Messiah. And then he immediately goes out and starts preaching Jesus as the Messiah. Hey, I found the Messiah that I was telling you about last week. Uh, well, yeah, he's already here. He's already been here. Let me tell you. And man, that will make an impact. 
Um, and, um, you know, he then starts going out on his own. Uh, all he needs to do is become a believer because he already knows Scripture. And once he knows, he can go out and debate it on his own. And so we think of Paul's missionary journey as Paul was leading this group of people and he was forming these churches. No, Paul was going out forming churches, sure, but he would then, in those groups, find new leaders and they would go off on their own journeys. He was multiplying the effort as he went. He wasn't the, the model the other apostles apparently gave is they were the sent ones, and so they went, and they planted church, and they went, and they planted church, and they went and planted church. And they expected that church to do the ministry in the community that was there. Paul has added another layer to it, is he's in the process not only evangelizing the community, he's recruiting other evangelists to go out and not just evangelize their community, but communities further away. And has already begun to teach some of his followers to do the same. Uh, uh, you know, Aquila and Priscilla led Apollos to the Lord, who then went out and became a traveling evangelist of his own. Now, he'd been a traveling evangelist for the... Uh, or a proselytizer, not evangelist, but a, pro, a proselytizer for John the Baptist uh, doctrines and uh, claim. Well, now he found the one that John the Baptist was preparing the way for had already been here. Okay, it's time to switch um, and start teaching what God had meant. Uh, that's not a hard switch for Apollos. Notice he's a Jew, also something about him. He's a Jew with a Greek name. It tells you something about the community. And by, by the way, Alexandria was also where um, the Hebrew scripture was translated into Greek, uh, the Septuagint. Um, and the tale about the Septuagint is 70 scholars were supposedly translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek independently, and they all came up with word for word the same translation. Um, even the Jews at the time knew that wasn't the truth. Uh, the 70 scholars met, and they translated scripture. But it's more like if we got 70 Christians together to translate scripture into a new language, they divided up the task, and they debated with each other, and they learned the new language, and if somebody had a question, how's the best way to translate this into that, they'd all get together and debate it, and come up with agreement of how to do it. And that's what the 70 scholars did. And yeah, I'm sure, you know, Joe got handed Genesis 1 through 13, and he got to translate it, and, uh, uh, Jim got to translate 14 through, you know, whatever uh, kind of thing. And then, you know, they'd be working in rooms next to each other. And, hey, Jim, I got a question. Can you come over and help me? Sure, Joe, I'll come over there. Oh, okay, let's debate that. And, uh, okay, here's the best idea we have, but let's go talk to the other fellas. And, you know, that's more how it actually happened. And uh, that's what history at the time said, too. Uh, but the legend that came out of it was they did it independently and then um, came together and had done it word for word. Uh, that wasn't the miracle. The miracle was that uh, for the first time the Jews were willing to translate their scripture into another language and have an authorized version. Uh, every time the before, even when nobody spoke, Hebrew. You had to read it in Hebrew. And you had to therefore understand Hebrew. Never mind you spoke Aramaic, which was almost like Hebrew. Um, a lot of the same grammar, a lot of the same root words, but things were a little different. It's kind of, uh, the, 
the similarity between Aramaic and Hebrew was the similarity between Portuguese and Spanish. Um, just close enough that if you don't speak either one, you're not sure which one it is if you were listening to it. On the other hand, if you were a native speaker of one, you didn't understand the other guy. And so Aramaic and Hebrew were definitely different languages. And um, there had never been an authorized Aramaic version. In the Aramaic speaking areas of uh, the Jewish uh, people, they still read it in Hebrew and then had somebody that knew Hebrew who would tr explain what it meant in Aramaic. And they had to pronounce it correctly. And they got to where it was important to pronounce it correctly because that was the only way to understand it. And there was communities of Jews that would read scripture every Sunday, every, every Sabbath. But none of them understood Hebrew. They would look at the symbols in the page, pronounce them correctly, with no meaning to them. It's in Alexandria that they said... Uh, Reading the Hebrew, when none of us understand Hebrew, is for the birds. We need to understand what it says. We can't just continue practicing what we think it means. Let's translate it from Hebrew into Greek, which we speak. So Apollos came from that background. And so he was more open to new ideas than even the Pharisaical Jews, who you had to do it in Hebrew. And... Um, so he, he learned that the Messiah had come, you know, he believed it, and then he began to preach it and practice it immediately. And um, he doesn't have to stay with Paul and, and Aquila and Priscilla for very long. He already knows Scripture. He just got to find the way of Jesus. And since there is no Jewish uh, Christian Scripture at this point in time, um. He doesn't need to, you know, learn any new scripture. Uh, Mark was probably in, at writing, or maybe not even have started writing yet. Mark may still be uh, over with um, um, Barnabas, um, you know doing missionary work, uh, for a lot we know. Uh, anyway, um, so, you know, he knows the scripture that is, and he goes out and preaches. And we'll catch up with Paul, Apollos later, because Apollos becomes part of the story, too. But um, he goes off in a different direction. And that is the model that we see Paul initiating on this second missionary journey. He doesn't arrive back home with anybody that left with him. He's left them all somewhere. Some of them he sent off on separate missionary journeys to go do their own thing. Um, he's recruited people that came with him part of the way and then sent them off on separate journeys. Some of them have now recruited people that they sent on their own missionary journey. So Paul... On the second missionary journey, goes and leaves the uh, missional model that the apostles had and develops a new one where he's multiplying the people doing the work. Yeah, he's still going out and evangelizing, and telling people about Jesus. Uh, he's still going to the synagogue and debating with the Jews and trying to convince them that Scripture proves that Jesus is the Messiah. And then he goes out in the marketplace and tries to convince Gentiles that they need to follow Jesus and start worshiping the one true God. Um, you know, it, that's, you know, that's Paul. But he also finds people capable of doing the work. And when they become believers, he, he sends them on, on their way or sometimes leaves them as the leaders in the community, or whatever. Um, he has got this big idea for, 
the work is so big, he can't do it. Uh, he can't even go preach the gospel in every town once and do it. He's got to recruit help in every town to go spread the gospel everywhere. And so he has uh, reached a new level of ministry in Christianity that had never been seen before. Uh, an intentional multiplying of the work. An intentional um, sending out of people that weren't directly called by God um, in person like he had been or the 12 had been. Um, he recognizes that everybody is called at some level. Some of us are more called to be sent. Some of us are more called to be leadership. Some of us are more called to do the work of the church in the local area. But all of us are called to win people to the Lord. And um, he's applying that model not only in the local churches he forms, but finding people in those churches to indeed leave from those churches and go out. So you don't have to be from the Jerusalem church. You don't have to be from Antioch. You don't have to be. You can be from Alexandria and in Corinth and then leave for Acacia. Would you not somewhere where Paul was going to ever end up? But they needed here too. So Apollos went. Lord Jesus, help us to be those people that reach out to our neighbors, to our friends, to our relatives, to our co-workers, to the acquaintances we meet, to strangers. Help us to support those who feel called to go. Help us to pray for them. Help us to support them financially. Help us to emulate them even, to go on our own. Uh, there are some that are outgoing and uh, uh, traveling kind of people, and that's who you're calling to go. But uh, then, Lord, there's also some that are more stay-at-home, and uh, we're needed here where we are to tell the people that are around us. Lord, help us to be uh, the people that see the work multiply and not just um, addition as we had a little bit by little bit. Lord, help us to be uh, people of prayer and people of the Word, that we would understand your Word and apply it. In your precious name, amen. I hope to see you next week, and I hope to see you on Wednesday. Um, we're going to have a very interesting week here. Uh, Carmen uh, has a birthday this coming week, and um, by Wednesday, she'll have been another year older. Y'all have a good evening.